So good afternoon. I'm Jen Dirks, President and CEO of Temple Milwaukee. Welcome to this important and critical discussion for our Tempo Talks session this afternoon. We are grateful you have joined us today. Today is September 11th and a somber day for our nation as we remember and honor all of the lives lost 19 years ago today in New York City at the World Trade Center in Washington and in Pennsylvania. We pause for a moment to remember. We realize our psychological plate is pretty full these days. My definitely is as I continue to come to terms with the gravity and impact of the coronavirus, the health and safety of my family and friends added to the racial injustices that continue to plague our nation and most recently in our own backyard right in Kenosha. To say the last five or six months have been heavy on so many of us, including me, is truly an understatement. It has been a challenging several months, but I am really grateful for today's discussion. I think it's an important one. It's an critical one. And I thank all of those who have joined us today for this really, um, um, really important dialogue. Uh, critical consciousness, are we awake yet? And the need for white racial resistance is resilience is the topic of today's session. We have two phenomenal Temple Milwaukee members, Erica Joy Daniels and Gretchen Jameson leading today's discussion. I will introduce them shortly, but I had a chance to sit down with these two women who had never met before uh, a couple of weeks ago to talk about bringing this content to our Temple Milwaukee members, our emerging women leaders, and the many guests with us today. And there was no lack of dialogue to be had and conversation to start. There was a infectious um, passion that was felt um, by myself and these two women, and I know it's going to be a really important and critical conversation. So I will introduce the two of them shortly. But for those of you who are joining our Tempo Talks for the first time today, a couple of housekeeping items that I want to share with you. All of our attendees have been muted. Um, all of the video has been disabled, but that does not mean we don't want to hear from you. So throughout today's session, if you have comments to share, please use the Q&A function, please use the chat function to ask questions. We have shared or will be sharing a couple of documents uh, for a call to action that Erica Joy and Gretchen will address at the end of today's session. So encourage you to continue the conversation in the chat box. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our Tempo Talks sessions. We started those when our world was uh, reinventing itself and life as we knew it uh, was suddenly changing. So we started our Tempo Talks to really provide value and resources to our members, to our emerging women leaders, and certainly to our guests. The, the beauty about these Tempo Talks is we tapped into our own uh, network of our 600 members, uh, temple members, and our emerging women leaders for their expertise in a variety of industries on everything related, related to uh, coronavirus, to just some of the challenges we were facing in the workplace, industries that were being impacted, and um, certainly in line with our equity and inclusion uh, conversations about uh, racial injustices uh, such as the one today. So these uh, started every Friday and now are every other Friday at 3 p.m. This has become a value add for our members. Uh, so this, these are not going away. We do see our Tempo Talks and our virtual uh, benefits continuing out through um, the, the course of Tempo's history. So thank you again for joining us today. Our Tempo Talks sessions would not be um, possible without the generous support of BMO Harris Bank. We are so grateful for their um, sponsorship of this important talk. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to board member and from BMO Health or from BMO Harris Bank, Mary Beth Cottrell to say a couple of words. Mary Beth. Oops, we have to unmute you. Hold on one second. Sorry, Mary Beth. Kelsey, if you can unmute Mary Beth. Thank you. 
There we go. It looks, Perfect. It looks Sorry. like I could. I was able to do that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mary Beth Cottrell, a private wealth advisor with BMO Wealth Management, and uh, we are proud sponsors of Tempo Talk. So happy that all of you are here to join us. Uh, keep spreading the word to the other members and guests to have them continue to participate. Today's topic is particularly close to me and to BMO. Um, in fact, I'm going to announce today that uh, our organization this week announced we are taking a bold step forward. The introduction of a new diversity strategy for over the next five years will provide more equity for groups facing the most systemic barriers, including Black, Latino, and Indigenous colleagues, customers, and communities. Three years ago, we were building on our history of championing diversity. We set 2020 goals for our workforce to ensure BMO reflected the communities we serve. They included hiring and promoting workforce to ensure BMO reflected those communities with more women and people of color into senior roles and increasing representation of indigenous peoples and pers persons with disabilities at all levels. So our new, our new initiative, our new strategy, we call Zero Barriers to Inclusion 2025. Um, it's a bold new diversity workforce target as well as community and others. And I just thought I would share a couple things um, that I hope that we are uh, uh, able to hear from others out there who are doing similar things. We're increasing representation of black employees in senior leadership roles. We have very specific targets, but I'll just share with you some of the, the highlights here. Increasing representation of people of color uh, as employees in senior leadership roles. Increasing representation of Latino employees in senior leadership roles. Sustaining our current gender equity position with a range of 40 to 60% representation in our senior leadership roles across our organization. A couple more, increasing representation of Black and Latino interns and entry-level employees to 30%, increasing representation of Indigenous peoples across our workforce, and representation of uh, persons with disabilities with a, a range of five to seven being the goal. And a last point, introducing LGBTQ2 plus representation goal of 3% of our workforce. Our last strategy over the last three years, we accomplished four out of the five priorities that we set, and we are looking forward to being part of a bigger community to continue to make improvements, and that call to action we'll be talking about soon, being part of all of our future. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Congratulations on launching Zero Barriers to Inclusion 2025. Sounds like a really uh, important dialogue that you're having. And thank you again for your support of our Tempo Talks sessions. So now I am so honored to introduce today's host, um, beginning with Erica Joy Daniels. Erica Joy Daniels is a community resource, to say the least. That is an understatement. With over two decades of development and consul consulting experience, she currently leads system-wide diversity and inclusion efforts at Advocate Aurora Health, Wisconsin's largest private employer and the 10th largest not-for-profit health system in the nation. Previously, Erica Joy was responsible for organizational development and global talent, talent management at Brady Corporation in Milwaukee. She also held progressive employee development positions at the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Washington, DC. Erica Joyce sits on a number of boards. The list is very long, but we are so honored to have her serving on our Temple Milwaukee board, as well as leading our equity and belonging initiative. Erica Joy joined Temple Milwaukee in 2013. Welcome, Erica Joy. Thank you, Jen and team. Thank you. And Gretchen Jameson. Gretchen Jameson has invested her career leading nonprofit organizations. Her leadership vision focuses on developing individuals and organizations to discover, achieve, and advocate their distinctive purposes for themselves, for others, and by extension for systems and communities. Gretchen currently serves as Senior Vice President for Strategies and University Affairs at Concordia University in Wisconsin and for their Ann Arbor, Michigan campus as well. Prior to this, Gretchen held executive leadership roles within the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. 
Gretchen joined Temple Milwaukee a little bit earlier this year and has already made an incredible impact. Welcome, Gretchen. I know it's been a crazy busy morning for you as well, but thank you both for being here today. It is great to be here, Jen. Thank you so much. Awesome. I am going to turn it over to the two of you ladies and uh, let's take it away for this important discussion. Excellent. So Erica Joy, it's kind of fun to think about the fact that Tempo basically decided to host our second date, right? Our second, our, our second chance to get together and to, to talk and to do it in front of, oh gosh, 78, 78 folks watching. But I'm just, I'm glad to see you. In my living room, so they can come on Yeah, in. come on in, right? I'm so glad to see you. How are you? I'm, candidly, I'm heavy this morning. Yeah. Um, but um, I think with that heaviness comes a, a bit of determination, so. Yes, right, yeah, we, huh. so it, it'll actually be public, well, it probably went public about 15 minutes ago. We had a, a significant retirement announcement at Concordia this morning and our top, mm. very top leadership, our president, uh, and also some opportunity to do some on-camera interviews with Fox about some COVID stuff. So it's been a day oh. and, I, and I found myself going, okay, and now we're gonna pivot and, and talk about this really critical topic. And, and I, yeah. I know the two of us just want to have a dialogue for the next yeah. 50 minutes. And I don't know, I, I want to let you start off, right? I've got kind of a framework. So everybody watching, we have sort of a, a framework of how, where we're going to try to take the conversation, but really what you're about to watch is hopefully some modeling of how um, two individuals who really don't know each other all that well can, can engage meaningfully and with deep authenticity and sincerity around really critical issues and really important values that move our communities forward, right? So, so Erica Joy, I know I just thought maybe if you have an open, how do you want to open us? And then, and then I'll say a little bit more about what we're hoping to do with this talk today. Okay. You know, it's interesting enough, Gretchen, when, um, as I was prepping to, for our, our time, I was like, I want to come out of the office and into my, my living room. Um, one, just because of removing myself from everything that does cloud my mind right now and a place where um, in our home is important to us to connect um, and what matters. And to me, conversations like this, they matter. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's so key when you, when you build relationships with, with individuals or you're even seeking to do such, it's taking the breath enough to pause and say, what do I really want to get from this? But also, mm -hmm. what do I want to give? Yeah. And um, I, I think it's interesting. It's, it's crazy how when we did meet the first time in person, uh, our first meet, and um, <laughs> Jen wasn't even, hadn't even gotten there. By the time she sat down, we were like, oh, maybe we should catch you up. <laughs> but um, that, that openness of just wanting to know from a very uh, present and authentic place. You know, I'm not really good at checking people's LinkedIn profiles before I meet them because I just feel like I want to meet them for who they are. Yeah. And they may never want us to talk about anything on their LinkedIn profile, but just who they were in that day. So I think for us today, let's just explore and learn about each other and allow us as a group of amazing women mm -hmm. to give ourselves the grace and permission to do so. There's so many places where we're leading, where we have to lead and start from that kind of place. Mm -hmm. But I think let's just take it back to a home-based kind of approach. I love it. And, and really that fits our theme, right? This idea of critical consciousness of developing mm -hmm. this intentionality right of setting mm -hmm. that intention of of approaching each interaction with another human <laughs> and having that opportunity to just be real and authentic with them in that place i think that is critical um, yeah. you know i've had some of the conversation we're going to have today with people i've known for a long time uh -huh. um, you and i haven't Right. and knowing each other for a long time. I hope we will. Um, but what, we're, what we see is when we come to it with that humility, that approach, that openness to being conscious, to being a, having awareness, mm -hmm. uh, that, that begins really powerful things. Um, mm -hmm. And so everyone watching today, you know, the, the title of this talk is a little provocative by design, right? Mm -hmm. Critical consciousness and racial resilience. What is that, right? And, and yeah. I'm gonna speak to you right now, friends, as, as a white woman, for me, this topic, um, along with so many other critical pieces that we're working on in our organizations, our systems, our communities, our neighborhoods, our homes, around issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, this, 
this theme of consciousness and resilience have become pretty profound for me to grapple with as, as, a, as a white woman. Mm -hmm. Thinking about, we've all heard by now about this idea of white fragility. I don't like being fragile. I'm a breast cancer survivor. Fragility is not, I don't like fragile. And, and how, do we, how do we break through fragility and what does that look like? And so um, devoting myself to that work is sort of like a good workout program, right? And I think for white women, this idea of racial resilience and consciousness requires us to unlearn um, perhaps some old patterns that may be in us from our upbringing to see things in ways maybe we've not consciously um, taken the time to notice before. And, mm -hmm. and I had a, a very dear professor in my doctoral work at University of Southern California who said, once you unsee, ev everything changes. Um, mm -hmm. And so just to, you know, to have a conversation on what does that look like? Um, but not to just have a white woman holding forth about that, but to, to go at it together, talk about it together, seek it out together. And then those of you watching today, don't worry. We have a call to action at the end that we're going to invite you to lean into this um, and think for yourselves what your intention will be in this work as well. So that kind of sets us up. But I don't know, Eric, do, I, do we want to start with just oh, so much going on? You know, what do we bring into the room today? I mean, there's been so much um in our in this during this covid great pause during this shutdown time with respect to race resilience diversity equity inclusion mm -hmm. just where are we at with that right now where are you at with that right now and just to maybe start there you know it's it's, it's interesting because i think um with all the things that have been hitting us and it's ironic that we're here on 9-11 you know mm -hmm. um in a day when an attack um hit home yeah. and when i think about racial injustice and inequities for me as a woman of color you know they are attacks that hit home mm -hmm. um having to balance the pace and, and the weight and at the same time when we've been confined to spaces where we don't have the same uh, outlets and avenues to mm -hmm. to 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 um, get released or get rejuvenated. You know, you can't go grab a movie to laugh again. You can't go to amusement park to <laughs> explore the outdoors again. Um, it's really causing us, I think, though, to pay attention and in mm -hmm. the stillness. There's some things you can only get when you're still. You know, there's some only there's things you can only process and grasp and understand when you're still. So to me, it's just it's really interesting. I mean. Jen, even when Jen acknowledged you know, uh, 9-11 at the start of our call, I was in DC, I was working in DC at the time, and uh, my brother worked uh, blocks from the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, I worked walking distance from um, the Capitol. And if we remember what happened in the course of events, you know, the alert was, you know, there's a plane coming that way. Um, there was a, and, and that was back when there were minimal cell towers. I couldn't call home. My parents couldn't get to us. We couldn't reach our siblings. We, we had no connection. I never forget the barricades that came out, the big black trucks that swooped through. There were, we were rushing in droves to the, to the train station to see if we could leave and just leave the city. Mm -hmm. And it, it was pure chaos. And I remember that all the hustle and bustle, there was this guy who had called someone. So I'm gonna tell, you know, we know how far back it's been. There was a payphone on the corner by Union Station. And a man has said, my wife's on the phone and can call people if you want, just to just as strangers. Wow. And just stopping to hear someone who was reaching out a lifeline. Mm. Fast forward 19 some years, and I think about, are we stopping and are we offering lifelines to people to be a connection and a resource mm -hmm. to them? Are we stopping and understanding that people are in need other than ourselves? It would have been easy mm -hmm. enough for him to finish his quarter call and hang up, right? Yes. But I think there was something in that moment that of consideration and pause that we've got to make sure that are we doing that now? When we're forced to pause, yes. are we stopping and reaching and in that reach, reaching across difference, whether they're strangers or not? Yes. And in this time, right, we, you, we could end up even more barricaded in our yeah. own experience, right? Because yeah. we're sitting in our own homes on our own Zoom calls. And so to, to have that, to make that choice, yeah. to seek out the difference and to seek out, I would say it this way too, this, this idea of values has really, for me during this time, mm -hmm. and I, I, full, I am fortunate 
yeah. so fortunate in this time to be able to reflect on values because my income has been secure and, and let's be flat out honest, there are millions of people for whom that is not the case. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I've been thinking a lot about values and, and, I, and with respect to this idea of diversity too, I, I've been thinking a lot lately, I'm curious what you think about this, that diversity, especially in your role, right? I'm pick your brain as a SVP of diversity, that diversity is not so much in and of itself a value as it is an outcome. Mm -hmm of lived values, values that we espouse all the time for difference and dignity and worth and value of individuals. Um, but when we live, when we enact those espoused values, that's when diversity becomes an outcome, mm -hmm. almost a natural, right? So I've been thinking about what are the values that are central to my thinking about race, ethnicity, gender, all of these differences, right? And what are my values there and how can I live out of those values in a way that results in greater diversity? And so for me in this time, I started this conversation, I think I mentioned to you when we met with, with women that I know from across the country and mm -hmm. we just started getting together and live streaming our dialogue, black, white, brown women, and mm -hmm. just talking about, about this stuff and, mm -hmm. and putting it out there. And, and for me, that has been incredibly powerful because frankly, I'm finding sisterhood in values shared that cross mm -hmm. all kinds of different intersections. And mm -hmm. I don't know, that's been meaningful mm -hmm. for, for me in this time. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I would just maybe tweak about that is I think that the inclusion and the belonging are the values associated with. Because mm. diversity, I don't know if it's as much of an outcome versus it is what it is. Diversity yeah. is just difference. Yeah. And whether we find, whether we select it or not, it's out there in the world. And we sometimes forget that. Like we, you don't have to go make diversity. Yeah. You just have to make room for diversity to be part of your life. Yeah. You see what I mean? Like, yes. because just the fact that diversity is on, on this, in this webinar, it's mm -hmm. between us, it's between the group, it's the representation that we have. And diversity just means difference that matters. Yeah. You know, that's why it's so important. And, and we all could plug into a number of different dimensions of diversity. So it, it amazes me that I think, though, that race and ethnicity is one of the hardest dimensions for people to have conversation about. Mm -hmm. it, it's one, it's something that becomes so either personal or so challenging or uncomfortable. I mean, mm -hmm. just the fact that we don't use the words, you know, we'll say diverse people. And I ask, well, that's everybody. Right. Say people of color if you mean it. That's, right. you know, yeah. that's yeah. the language, yeah. you know, if, because then, then, then that means that those are just the different people. We're all different, you know? So I think it is recognizing the fact that there's so much difference in our world. Mm -hmm. um, the value is, are we going to value the difference mm -hmm. that we have? Mm -hmm. Are we going to entertain, invite, and engage with difference? Um, and are we gonna allow for a safe place for learning across difference that can then lead to outcomes like belonging, yeah. like connection, like shared learning? You know, mm -hmm. those are the mm -hmm. goals that we really want, you know? that you can have difference in a dialogue and a debate and still have connection. Right. We forget that. We, we get so tied on fixing to our point or our position and it's so yeah. this versus this. You can have difference in a debate and still be connected. And difference within ourselves. Like I can sit with two seemingly difficult, contradictory truth. I can sit with that. I can sit with that and make and hold space for that. Yeah, that's okay, right? I a couple words you used I really love, and I think they tether to the topic. And I want to make sure those of you watching sit with these words. Making space, you said it's it's about making space for diverse. Making space, that's consciousness, right? Make choosing that this is something I'm going to hold space for in my life, and if it's not there, I'm gonna I'm gonna really think critically about my own neighborhood, my own community, my own system. And, and if it's not there, and I'm speaking to my white colleagues and sisters and brothers who are watching this call, choosing to be aware of that and choosing to make space for that. Um, and that's part of that unlearning that I think is, is really critical, um, that we choose to have that level of awareness and then to take action around it. And that yeah. that is, I think sometimes in particular, I'll speak for self, um, I think I see that as a challenge in, in majority white spaces where that sort of critical consciousness um, really is not something we think about even in terms of our our own sense of, of white what does it mean to be white whiteness mm -hmm. uh, 
sort of an underformed sense of that. And, and that, is, that is actually some pretty important work. Mm -hmm. I want to move us to a little, a little quiz activity. This will be kind of fun. We'll see how this works. So um, everybody watching, I'm going to screen share here. I'm also going to put a link into the chat box. And when you go to that link that I just put into the chat box, and I will screen share in a moment too, when you go to that link, it's going to ask you for a code. And I'm going to, I'm going to invite you to put in this code that I just put into the chat box. If you're not able to open on another device because you're on your phone and you're catching this at your lunch break or what have you, don't worry. I'm going to screen share. And so you're still going to be able to play along. So, so don't, no worries. Let me screen share this fun little quiz. And, and what this is, is just an interactive sort of fun way to invite all of you. Oh, there you go. Look at you guys answering that to, to begin to frame up just first of all, who's in the room, right? Erica Joy, it's always nice to know who's in our room because we can't mm -hmm. see you. Um, and, and then to begin to think about when did we become first aware of racial identity? Because this idea, and again, I'm speaking as a, as a white person, this idea of thinking about what it means to be white is not something that white people often do because we have the luxury of it just sort of being the norm in the room, right? And so we don't think about it. And it's actually a pretty critical piece. So I'm just gonna ask a few little questions and then Erica Joy, we're gonna talk a little bit about our own awareness when we first became aware of our own racial identity and, and, and how did that go for us, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna advance this in a minute to the next, once you guys are watching, it's a really, this really white room. Erica Joy. <laughs> I'm looking at our, I'm looking at our data coming in. Uh, I'm trying to watch a critical mess, but. I know, right, right? So this is interesting. All right, I'm going to advance us. So if you are white and in the room, if you are white and in the room, I invite you to answer this slide. And, and friends of color in the room, the next slide is yours, okay? The next slide is yours. And I, I did it this way. I thought about the way to put this. And I, and, and for our white colleagues, I'm, I'm kind of, forcing your answer before you get a chance to learn from our colleagues of color. All right, good. Let a few more minutes go by while you take a second here. Okay, that's about the room. We're close to about what that number was. All right, friends of color in the room. And again, we can't tell who you are. We just see people answering, right? If you're willing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if, you know, it's kind of, I'm gonna toggle back and forth between these as you guys are, are putting in your answers, right? So we see a pretty interesting split, which actually is more awareness than we usually see when I ask these questions as part of some of my work at USC often white rooms have a much more skewed to the no side of things. So this is actually a very, but it's tempo. So we expect our, our members to be, have more self-awareness, um, but as compared, right? As compared, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. We'll come back together. And so just a little exercise to get the group, you know, get our, our own gray matter thinking, but I don't know, let's talking about that idea of awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and do you have a story or a, a you know, perspective on that awareness of racial identity and how that how that happened for you mm. yeah it it was early Gretchen I mean I my parents so I'm from the east coast originally and um, uh, my parents were from Baltimore City uh, right before I was born they moved out to an area called Hartford County um, and my parents said they wanted to help us deal with difference while they could help us deal with difference mm. then they knew we would have to learn we were older they wanted to be part of that you know, growing up. Um, there were times, and they told us when we were older that they were times where they felt like, did we make the right decision? But I remember being in um, second grade and um, coming home, we were on the bus stop. Uh, we went to a, a private school. My parents worked really, really hard to get us into a school. And um, we were, I was the only person of color um, in my whole class. <laughs> and there were probably like six of us in the entire school. So that's just to kind of give you a sense of what's skewed, right? And my brother and I were on the bus coming home and I never forget, I mean, as I can remember myself in my uniform, I can remember the red truck and we were coming up a hill to get to the house and a red pickup truck pulled over, splashed water on us. And then at the top of the hill, got out with a bat and the guy said, niggers go home. 
Me and my naive said was like, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> my brother grabs me. We run to our, thank God his Boy Scout troop leader was in the, lived not too far from our bus state stop. My mom worked for the police department. So he called the police, of course. They, police picked us up from the, but the scout leader's house, took us home, our neighbors. And mind you, there's no neighbors. There's like one family down the street of, of color. Um, a, Philip, a two, a Filipino family and an African-American family. And um, our neighbors saw the, the issue and asked my parents what happened. They were, they were very close and still are close to this day. And they asked, um, once they found out what happened, they asked my mom and dad, can we come over and talk to the kids with you? And my mm -hmm. mom and dad had a choice to make. You know, either this is our home issue, we're going to handle this. But they gave space mm -hmm. for a non-family of color to come in and have a conversation with us distinctly about race in a very direct way. And I will never forget that. Um, one, from the sake of understanding. I mean, growing up, my parents were very, very clear about you, you, you will have challenges, you have issues. I remember being younger and my dad taking my brother, you know, a car ride to tell him what to do when you ca get caught out and you get pulled over in areas like this. You know, they would go to the city and they would take the bus and understand the difference between the city and the, and the county mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, of my sister, what would she do if she got pulled over if it was just the two of us? You know, when we where places we couldn't go that was by where we lived after a certain time. Um, but it just became really real, but it, and it became raw to me. Mm -hmm. And um, it also takes me back to once I was in high school, uh, I had uh, was working at the polls, working for the voting polls. That could have come across really bad, but I was working voting polls. Well, that's the kind of poll I was working. And, <laughs> Sorry, bad joke, y'all. But I, and I remember this little girl came up to me and I was reading a book and she said, hey, you're black. And the mother just turned beet red again in an area where there's not a lot of people of color. And then she, she just started fumbling and stuttering. And I said, sweetheart, I am like mm -hmm. the mother was so and then she was apologizing. You know, I, she's never seen somebody black before. But it hit me like mm -hmm. it's so apparent and it's so necessary to be called out for some people. But why is that? As I live in a world where I have to watch and learn how others do, how I have to watch how I, my, my grandmother was old school. She born in 1908 and she would tell me, hold your lips in, you know, hold down your nose. The things where I had to assimilate and watch another world. Um, and that became really challenging where <laughs> there was no freedom for who, this is who you are, recognize who you are, but recognize who you are in the world that you have to live in. And that was very hard. You know, I, I think about, um, as I reflected on the talk for today, I, I really spent time journaling and thinking about, you know, when was it for, for, for me? So I, my parents were both teachers and my mom grew up in Detroit, Michigan. My dad grew up on the west side of the state in a farming community. Um, so very different upbringings, but, but as they raised my sister and I, we actually lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I guess reflecting now when I've been there on business trips to go back and look at our old house, I suppose we weren't in a great neighborhood. Mm -hmm. As a kid, that didn't stand out to, to me. Um, my best friend next door, Nicole, uh, was a little girl of color. Um, my preschool and kindergarten were actually very mixed. It was when I was, I was really, so I kept digging. When was it? I was nine years old. And we were at my grandparents' home in Detroit. And my grandfather um, and my mother, full disclosure, played guitar, sang in coffee shops, protest music. She was, she's, she's that, she <laughs> drives a Subaru. So let me just be real clear about my mom. <laughs> but my grandpa was not of that cloth. And he made some really remarkable statements at the dinner table. And I was nine. And I have a vivid memory of sitting on the bed in my mom's old bedroom with my dad and my mom explaining to me why what my grandfather said was absolutely unacceptable. Mm. I mean, I have this, I had to think about it, but I have this memory of that. And, and as a kid going, well, I didn't understand, but they, they corrected that. Mm. Well, I jump forward to, I have two girls. I have a seventh grade girl and a mm. five-year-old. No, okay. five um, and we have our very, very dear friends um, who are president of the university on the East Coast, um, African-American couple. And we had this really powerful conversation. We go to the same, we go to the same summer retreat together. Mm -hmm. every year. And, and they, 
they really talked with us about why that, to your point about the white woman being embarrassed, like, like, like white people, like you're not supposed to acknowledge color, why that was like the worst way we could possibly raise our children. And yeah. that that is just not how, it, it can't be that way. We need to be very clear about white, black, color, seeing color and talking about color and acknowledging difference and building already in our girls a sense of understanding about what they need to know about their color and what they need to do in service and in love and in value and community to everyone around mm. them. Yeah. That, so those two things as I reflected on this, both how I was parented and now how I'm choosing to parent yeah. really stand out for me. You know, it's an interesting question when you say that. I think that's why it confused me and bothered me and still does when people say, I don't see color. Mm -hmm. I, it always takes me back to that little girl. And I'm like, you're lying. Like, you, you, you that's not true. I under, and I understand the intent, right? But, mm -hmm. but then I hope that people would understand the intention of why I want you to see who I am. You know, EJ is who she is because of her lived experience, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and when we think about that, you know, how there's part of, yes, Sam, when you think about the platinum rule, right? I want you to treat me for who I am based on how I want to be treated, you mm -hmm. know? And some of that comes with who I am and what I've lived through and, and, and what my background is like, you know, my, mm -hmm. my diverse thoughts is because of all of this diversity that's wrapped up in this woman. So yeah. um, that's important for people to not, not ignore. Well, and the code language, right? That, that I don't see color. What does that code speak for? And Lori just posted in the chat a concern about equating bad neighborhoods with mixed diverse. Let me be clear, Lori. As a kid, I thought I had a great neighborhood. Um, and I still think I had a great neighborhood as a kid. It's, that's also code speak, right? And so getting underneath, what do we mean when we use those turns of phrase? When we say, oh, I don't see color. What, what are we really saying by that? Um, and, and what do we really mean? And so this is actually a great segue into, um, Kelsey, can we show the video that we have? Because um, I think this moves us into our next kind of conversation about privilege. Okay, this is a very short clip. And, and so we're gonna show this clip and it might be a little difficult to hear. Um, so maybe turn up your volume, but let's, let's watch this really short clip and then let's transition into this conversation about privilege on the other side of the clip. And Kelsey, I can do it too if it's not if it's not cooperating. Having some technical difficulties on oh, my end. If how about how about I I'll bring it up and and since you gave me screen sharing capacity, I can go ahead and help with that. See, we've all become just such Zoom like <laughs> so Zoom proficient. We can zoom around and fix this. Let me hold on just a second, guys. Okay, I'm going to start this over and I'm going to screen share and I'm going to volume share. So we'll give this a go. Here we go. Let me share computer sound. And let me see if I can make this full screen. I'm sorry. So Erica, this is our, this is our, um, our, you know, pause in the action here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is very brief, ladies and gentlemen who are watching. Here we are. Oh, is it not plain now? If you, as a white person, would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening you know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. Mm. So, and, and there's a lot in there, right? There's a lot in there about privilege. There's a lot in there that we can talk about. And I guess I just want to open it up. That's Jane Elliott, for those of you who don't know. And Jane Elliott has spent a career in anti-racism research. You can look her up. I encourage you to look her up and read her work. Um, that's a very quick clip. 
But EJ, I don't know, do we want to react? I mean, it's, it kind of gets into this idea of, I don't see color. Um, and bridges us to this idea about privilege and, and white fragility, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think what, and Jean Elliott is, um, I mean, you, you talk about a, a historic legacy minded, determined passion person. Um, and when she started her work, it was, she was really influenced by the shooting of Dr. Martin Luther King and what she was gonna do because she was an educator mm -hmm. and knowing that in the schools, <laughs> she could make a difference. She lost a lot by raising her voice, even her own family members. Um, so when you think about the risk that we're willing to take for knowing what's right or wrong and speaking up, it reminds, it, 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 it makes me think about like, you know, like on those, um, Dateline shows where they research how many people will walk by an incident and not say anything. Um, that's, that's what happens when people feel like there's an injustice mm -hmm. and individuals act as if they're just innocent bystanders and there's no alert. You know, there's, there's no call to action. There's no one calling 911. There's no, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be at a pool and see someone choking and not call a lifeguard, you know? So why do we allow that to happen from a racially unjust way? Um, when there are lives at stake, you know, and it's a key thing. And, and you know what, you don't have to be trained because often people say, well, I don't know what to say or do. All you, it doesn't take any training. I'm not going to call, I'm not going to do CPR. I've learned it, but I'm not comfortable but I do know how to call for help, mm -hmm. somebody who does. And I think that's what people are mm -hmm. asking, looking for. To me, what she said those years ago is what we now want to call, and I don't say it flippantly, don't mean it at all, but we, as if it's not a new term, but anti-racism. It's, it's being, it's the deliberate moves. It's, it's not just saying, I don't believe it, but I'm gonna, you're gonna see how much I don't believe it by my actions, my intentions, and my seeking to understand myself. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really the platform of what she's demonstrating and an acknowledgement of where we sometimes are not paying attention mm. enough. Well, and it, it's, uh, that clip is powerful for a number of reasons. You know, there's been this in white circles that I'm in, um, this sort of contentiousness over the use of white privilege, the, this sort of fight about, oh, I've, what, what Jane Elliott does in that clip is she sets aside this debate, in my view, over whether privilege is fundamentally about, and, and I think there's a danger when we make it about wealth or possession or how hard we've worked in our job. And she basically, what I hear her saying is, <laughs> white privilege fundamentally is the, the choice to sit there and do nothing. Mm -hmm. That actually, we have, white people can be very comfortable we don't have to. To me, all the other dialogue and debate about what privilege may or may not be that people kind of are able to use as a red herring about fighting about what that word means right now mm -hmm. is fundamentally about the fact that you can choose to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Because I, and as I reflect on my conversations with my sisters of color who I know very well, mm -hmm. that's a choice they really have. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 and the choices that you don't get to have, you know, because the privilege is access mm -hmm. without a price tag on it. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. I have a job. Um, you know, I have a home. I have some things and I have some access, but there's still some things that mm -hmm. I can't access because of who I am. I, 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 I have the, I don't have the ability to live where I live and not have been pulled over at minimum once a year for nothing. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have the access to be able to go into any hair salon and sit down and say, can you make me more beautiful without them asking, I'm not really sure how to do your hair, you know, mm -hmm. and that has nothing to do with the price tag or how much money there is in the bank. Right. And so it's the choices we do with what that access looks like and knowing that others don't even have some of those options. Yes. Um, there are some things that are not options for me. And, and I, I was raised not to be bitter or have a chip, but to understand that, to say, well, how do you navigate through life? Mm. Um, and, and I think that's what's key and what's important for people to say, well, and how do you, how do you understand, with, understand that with authentic curiosity? You know, not from a place of, of debate, but a, of a place of, of recognizing it. Mm -hmm. Acknowledgement alone is something that just is, I think, not not present enough 
mm. and the, the whole clash of conflict across difference. Jen's put a couple questions for us, and, and Jen, we want to get to these. There's a, a question from an attendee. Gretchen, how are you having these conversations outside of your circle of women with other white women and men who are not where you are with race and diversity? Um, whew. You know, when we when we live our values, right, that, that will inherently bring conflict when we have to take a stand on those values. I would say I strive to enter into those conversations. And it, speaking as a white to other whites, it's pretty you can figure out where people fall on these issues pretty quickly, right? Um, and so I try to enter into those conversations like I would any conversation around difference of values with gentleness and winsomeness first. Mm -hmm. But there are moments when you have to also um, be brave and I'll give two examples. So I, at my, my work, I, I've recently gone through the paces to become a member of the faculty in addition to the administration. And so they asked me to lead a, a book talk and I selected this one, Eddie Laude Jr.'s new book, Begin Again. If you haven't read it, read it. Uh, it is provocative and it will upset some people. Um, I, those conversations start in a week, so you all can uh, ask me how it's going then. But I know, I know what I'm walking into because it's going gonna, it's gonna to invite into the room um, an array of opinion an array of opinion and, and defensiveness and, and sort of textbook fragility, I would assume. Um, so there's that. I, I'm nervous about it. There's that. But then there's also in my own my own neighborhood um, in our in our neighborhood Facebook group the other day, um, someone posted, did everyone see this um, on and they shared the date. We're going to have a, a Black Lives Matter protest here in our neighborhood. And as we know, these get out of hand. And so I just we need to all be very concerned. And you could see and you can see how there's how many people have viewed it. And I'm watching this. This is on like Saturday evening and I'm watching and I'm feeling my anger and my frustration. And I'm, I live in, in an all white neighborhood. And I, come on, Gret, are you really going to say nothing? And so I framed it up and I simply said, thank you so much for sharing this date and this time. My daughters and I have marched safely three times in Milwaukee, in, in the city including at the Mother's March, and we will gladly march again. It's been a safe experience, and thank you for letting us know so that all of our families can gather. <laughs> There's been no other comment, hundreds of likes, or hundreds of views, hundreds of views, like three likes. And I thought, man, that's nothing compared to what my sisters and friends of color have to do every day. Mm. So I guess sometimes to the question, sometimes I'm you're, you have to just take, be very brave and do something really outspoken. And other times it's just those soft ways of, are you gonna, are you gonna let that stand? Are you gonna not make a comment? And now everyone in my neighborhood, I guess probably knows where, where the Jamison family stands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now maybe yeah. we can have some other conversations. So I don't know. Um, EJ, there's a question for you. This work is exhausting leading an agency and DEI during this time and dealing with your own personal feelings and processing everything is consuming. How do you stay energized and how do you stay hopeful? Ooh. Um, well, there, there's a, there's kind of a, an approach we use in our family. Um, for those who know me, um, I am a woman of faith. So faith, um, focus and family, those things are really core for me. Um, I, I have to, I have to ground myself um, because it is a weight. You know, my um, my son is an old soul, and uh, kind of midsummer, he had told me, he "said Mommy, I know why you're so tired." He said, "The first pandemic hit, and that's where you work in healthcare. The second one hit, and that's what you do every day." And I'm like, "That's if I could have described it in a nutshell, it is. It's hard, um, but my family helps ground me as well." Because I I I need I, I just feel driven to keep a focus for the window of time. I to be honest, Gretton family, I I worry that the there's gonna be less shine on all this in just a few months. I, I feel like there was a heat and an energy, but I feel like people are already becoming numb again. And in this window of time, how do we make that work? Mm -hmm. It is very hard when it's so personal, you know. Um when I said I was heavy yesterday, my son had a pretty rough encounter um, via virtual chat at school and someone said a um, very derogatory slur. 
And I want to add fuel to the fire, but I, I appreciate the fact that the principal has jumped in right away and he has his um, investigation interview today. Um, but you know what made me hopeful? My son said, mom, I got this. He said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach my teacher and I'm going to share with her what that word means and the history of it. And I'm going to share how offensive it was. And just the fact that he would have courage enough to speak up, um, that's what keeps me hopeful. That my determination of what I do every day is because there are those who are either not going to have the courage or need a platform that once they get courageous enough, someone's got to be there to help them either jump or to swim or go home where they need to go next. And, um, and, and acknowledging when it's heavy, acknowledging when it's, it's kind of, it's, it's almost to the brink of being too much. Um, and then honestly having a safe place of, of people who I can um, let down my guard and be as open as I need to be when the fatigue is real. Yes. Oh, Erica Joy. Do you mind if I ask how old's your son? We talked about he's 12. So he's he and, my, son, 12. He and my, my girl are the same age. Yep, they're the same age. Yep. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was reflecting on the title of this topic and it was kind of prescient, right? Because we, we thought about this months ago. Uh -huh. And to your point, like, are people moving on? That's so our culture. That's so our, how we're wired. And so to have this topic now, it just, are we awake yet? Or are we, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's an ongoing work. You know, also being a woman of faith, I think too, we, I think we understand that in some unique ways, right? This ongoing work that's constantly being worked out in us. And, and all of us have our different sources of those identities, friends who are watching that, you know, that, that kind of form you and help shape you and grow you through your life. And, and this is, this is part of that that work together. Yeah. You know, I want to put the, I'm going to put the link back in because friends, we said we would give you a chance to have some part in this. And so again, I put the link in and I'll put the code in again so that if you didn't just memorize that, you still got it. So it's 48, 89, 28. And, and again, I'll screen share so you can see it and play along, even if you can't get to the link, but this one invites you to just set your own intention, your own, your own word of intention for the, the action. It, and it may be friends, it may be simply thoughtful reflection. It could be attitudinal. So, you know, but a word that will capture your sense of intentionality about this work um, that we have as, as leaders, um, as people who want to make impact. Um, let me screen share. There you go. Excellent. So here they come. So just put those, you can put in one, two, three, you can put in as many words as you like. There we go. Watching this. And Jen, this would be kind of a fun visual to maybe share out with your tempo social media, <laughs> the commitments of tempo to this work. And, and we see these beautiful intentions, educate, speak up, courage, Kindness, love, curiosity. I love that one. Curiosity, right? Commitment, inv invitation. So friends, as you're putting these in, just, I often think, you know, we, we say out sometimes, uh, assume the best intentions, assume the best intentions. We hear that phrase. As you're watching these words come in, here's the proof that we can assume the best intentions for many of our tempo Temple friends. <laughs> there's, there's, there's the heart of this group on this call. I wanted to, um, as you watch those come in, I, I want to just finish this. So I, I mentioned the Eddie Glaude book and, and uh, it's, it is a powerful read and, and he includes in here a passage. So he's reflecting in the book on the work of James Baldwin. And if you haven't read much James Baldwin, I highly recommend that too. That's kind of a I was a former literature teacher, so you're, you're seeing my nerdy side. But Baldwin wrote this, and I think this is a good note to maybe finish on, but Erica, I want to give you the last word. So I'm going to read this passage and then let you reflect, and, and then I'll draw it to our close. But in his last novel, this is Glaude writing about Baldwin, in his last novel, Just Above My Head, Baldwin provided the key to surviving and mustering the strength 
to keep fighting amid the aftertimes, which Glaude talks about in this book. And here's what Baldwin writes. When the dream was slaughtered and all that love and labor seemed to have come to nothing, we scattered. We knew where we had been, what we had tried to do, who had cracked, gone mad, died, or been murdered around us. And yet, not everything is lost. Responsibility cannot be lost. It can only be abdicated. If one refuses abdication, one begins again. EJ, what do you think? You know, the word that sits on my heart from that, um, Greta, is um, the responsibility piece. Um, we all have a choice to make if we're going to be responsible enough to lead. The three words I had put were lead, love, and learn. You know, if we could just listen to each other a little bit more, if we could learn and not um, let contention be our barrier um, and don't give up. I just beg this group, don't give up. Mm. Don't let 2020 have come in a year where planners didn't work because we couldn't plan. Let's not run from it too fast, but let's not miss um, what we need to do that we continue to do. Even if others around us turn the calendar and say, whew, that was 2020, now we're in 2020. Let's not let that be said of us. Let's be so committed that something pivotal sh shifted our thinking and our behavior and our commitment shows, you know, build a new relationship with somebody. And, and I mean, authentically, like I, I mean, the terms of allyship, I appreciate it, but I don't want to be the subject of someone's movement, mm -hmm. but I would love to be the end of their friendship, you know? So I think if we, if anything, let's, let's be so determined. And even if the window closes, it's not going to close. The curtain doesn't close on our own exploration of digging in. So um, I, I appreciate this moment more than you guys know. And um, I think there's so much more for us to understand about each other, which if we're really open can be really exciting. I'd love to be the end of your friendship. Okay. <laughs> If you've got room. <laughs> Jen, it's all yours, sister. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, ladies. Um, what a rich um, and incredible dialogue. EJ, some of the things that, you know, struck me from what you have said, we all have a choice. Um, the, the lead, love, learn aspect. And something that you said about, um, you know, your worry that there's already a sense that people are numb to what's going on around them. And I... I'm, you know, kind of feeling them and a little discouraged by that, even in, you know, I feel like our Temple Real Talks discussion started off with a really committed 200 people logging on. And as we go through chapter by chapter of white fragility, you know, we've seen less and less people joining and it may be a number of different circumstances, timing, you know, the summer months, but we as temple members, as emerging women leaders, um, it is critical that we continue this conversation and be a part of this, this um, dialogue. And so, you know, I guess my call to action would be to talk to your temple sisters, to talk to your network of 600 plus women and encourage them to be in these conversations, to be involved and to help us change the narrative and to strengthen our voice in this community. So thank you so much, EJ. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for this um, conversation. The Tempo Talks conversations do continue throughout the summer. We have um, a slide that we'll put up uh, concerning the, the one uh, we have on September 25th. It is in conjunction with a professional development series. So creating a uh, solid foundation for living uh, connected joyful lives and then again join us on Friday October 9th for a conversation that we're actually having from and hearing from a lot of our Temple Milwaukee members and our emerging women leaders about juggling this act um, between coronavirus between gender inequality between working moms there's a lot of stuff a lot of heavy stuff to EJ's point earlier that are um, you know impacting our members and so we 
joining for this discussion will be really important. So thank you all for joining us on uh, this Friday. Thank you again, EJ and Gretchen for a really rich discussion. We've got a lot of questions that are still coming up. We will continue to share that. We have recorded this session. Um, so I encourage you to share that among your Tempo and EWL networks as well. Thank you to our guests for being here today. We will um, be in touch and thank you. We'll see you um, in two weeks, September 25th, if not sooner. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.